Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. Well, we're near the end of 2016, and normally most news networks do a review of the year and highlights, and of course we're getting near the end of the Obama administration, and we do a big review of the Obama administration. But frankly, there's been so much news and so much to do to cover the incoming Trump administration that we really haven't had time to do much of the review. But we thought we would at least pick out a few highlights and ask Abby Martin to work with us on t in talking about them. So now joining us from New York City is Abby Martin. Abby is the host and creator of The Empire Files for Telesur. Thanks for joining us, Abby. Thanks, Paul. You know, I wouldn't really call these highlights as much as lowlights. Because yeah. there's been so many devastating tragedies that have happened in the last year. And I thought that we should just go over a few of them. and talk about what the media missed and, and really uh, what happened. Uh, I wanted to start off with the Oakland fire, um, the ghost ship warehouse fire that tragically went down a couple weeks ago. This was particularly close to my home and heart being from Oakland. My brother's very close to the community there. He's an electronic music musician under the, um, uh, under the name of Fluorescent Gray. Um, it, it, it's very shocking because the way that this was covered was kind of, okay, a bunch of irresponsible people had a rave and you know this was an unfortunate happenstance that comes with illegal activity right and I got a lot of people kind of trolling me about this and it was very insulting because I, I can't think of another time in history not only was this the deadliest inferno in Oakland's history but I can't think of another time when so many tragic young artists souls were taken from us at such an early age Paul all at the same place because the people that died here were really you know, these were staples in the art community and the electronic music scene that had been either ostracized from the mainstream establishment. They don't play shows in the mainstream venues. They aren't as recognized. A lot of them were trans youth. And a lot of these people were there early on um, setting up art installations, um, the, running the bar, running the sound. And so these were people who were such staples of the community. And it is such a horrific, horrific loss. Um, for the Bay Area, and of course, the renting crisis. I mean, I wanted to talk to you and, and get your uh, opinion on just what this really speaks to, which is a rent, out of control rent crisis and housing crisis where Oakland is now the fourth most expensive city in the entire country. What do you think about that? Well, one is the rent crisis in, in most of the urban centers so where it's, it's, you know, almost, un, it's really unaffordable for except in, area, in cities where you have deep poverty in the urban centers, in cities that have reclaimed and enlivened their downtowns, it becomes unaffordable and uh, become places just for the rich. But, but I, I, what I thought was interesting about this is that people, to create these kinds of art, artist environment, not just because of the rent, but because there's so little subsidy and support for the arts. Uh, you know, we're talking about an infrastructure program, and Trump's talking all about an infrastructure program. But the model of infrastructure program that one worked uh, and had a big impact was during the New Deal in Roosevelt, where you had the federal government directly employing, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people. And, but within that, a lot of the funding went to the arts, and you had, you know, artistic troops and theater groups, and uh, right from across the country to New York City, uh, and and that culture and art was considered an, an important, legitimate place to put public funding. And now most of the public funding, if, 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 although it's very small, goes to still goes to like high art, like stuff like opera and things that the elites like to go to. And I'm not putting down opera, but in terms of popular uh, culture created by ordinary artists, ordinary meaning not famous and celebrity, there's next to no support at all, anywhere from filmmaking to uh, creative arts and graphic arts and so on. So I, it's a combination of crazy high rent and something that society just doesn't consider creativity, artistic creativity, something worth publicly investing in. It's only whether it makes money in the marketplace. Other than that, it's of no value at all. You're totally right. Uh, art and music are the first things cut from public education. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people across the country that are living in spaces like this because they are illegal, because they can't afford to live within the legal constraints of what has become an, impossibly, an impossible situation of rent and housing. And, and we're talking about landlords who exploit the poor, the young, the art community. I mean, this guy, Derek Ion, um, he, he's a scumbag. He was taking 
thousands and thousands of dollars from the tenants ignoring all of the safety complaints. This started because of an electrical fire that could have been easily fixed with a couple hundred bucks covering the electric box, um, making sure it was properly managed. And he knew that he was hosting shows there. So people had um, tried to complain before he had threatened them. And I think this just really speaks to the system favors landlords. You know, we're talking about even if this guy is slapped with um, a huge fine, that's no different than a permit for plunder that we see all across um, capitalism, right? BP, the oil spill. All of these things are manageable for them. Because at the end of the day, I mean, maybe not someone like this guy who should be in jail, um, but the woman above him, who was also the bigger landlord who owned multiple warehouses, it was the same kind of thing, this exploitation and um, just profiting and plundering, you know, and, and whatever they get slapped with will be worth it for them. These 36 souls that are gone will be worth it because they'll just pay a couple thousand dollars and move on, Paul, to the next project. Right. Now, one of the other uh, tragic events of the year uh, was the uh, pulse killings in Orlando. Uh, what are your thoughts about the significance of that? So, God, this is just such a horrific event. You know, in light of kind of these, what seemed like a big move forward, you know, the Supreme Court ruling the year before, Obama kind of embracing LGBTQ rights, um, and a lot of movements for it, especially when you look at the media and, and entertainment culture. It's this accept acceptance and normalization of uh, queer identity and, and gay culture. Unfortunately, with that comes a lot of visceral hatred and backlash. Um, and so what I think the media got wrong, of course, was immediately painting this as a terrorist attack affiliated with ISIS um, and making it all about Islamic terrorism. As I was looking back in retrospect, a lot more people later on took into account the LGBTQ aspect. And of course, this is a huge hit for the community. I mean, it shook terror across the LGBTQ community, but the media really missed the boat, Paul. They made it all about Islamic terrorism and really missed that big analysis, that deep analysis on the struggle of gay rights in this country and how much further we still have to go. I mean, we're talking about an epidemic here, and especially when you're talking about trans people, trans people of color, in 2015, 21 deaths of transgender people. In 2016, the same amount. Um, and a lot of these people are misgendered. They're never acknowledged as trans. Um, you know, even Breitbart has cited a hate group, an anti-LGBTQ hate group, 19 times since March, to basically propagandize against trans medical, um, <laughs> uh, you know, basically just propaganda against medical care for trans youth. And this is in the ear of the president, as Steve Bannon. So, you know, this is a huge issue. And, and I think that we all need to really understand that aside from, you know, Trump getting elected and, and emboldening all these fascists and racists on the ground, second to racially motivated attacks, this is the next thing that's happening is sexual um, orientation motivated attacks and it's happening all over the place. And I thought something else interesting in this whole area that happened in 2016 was the kind of welcoming of sorts uh, by Trump at the Republican convention of gays into the Republican party and, so, and voting for Trump. And Peter Thiel, one of the Silicon Valley uh, billionaires who had come out as gay spoke at the, uh, at the convention and putting on this face of, of a welcoming face, and I, I thought it's interesting how, how much this is now also a class issue on how, you know, society, and particularly conservative society, looks at this, which is if you are gay, but you can make a lot of money, you're within the business world, you stay with kind of within the limits of accepting everything else about society as it is, well, we can kind of ex open a door, accept you in, in, of sorts. But if you are transsexual, uh, if you, and if in any way your sexuality also is connected to oppositional politics, where you're you know, rejecting the political economic status quo as, as well, well then, we'll, yeah, we'll completely marginalize you. So, so it's like a class division even within the way society is tr treating this community. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at uh, the gay community, huge gains in the last 10 years, it's really, okay, marriage is an institution that's based on property and, and ownership. And then you look at, you know, in the military, don't ask, don't tell. I mean, that's kind of crazy that those institutions are where gay rights have really moved forward the most. And I think that that's a troubling aspect. We need legislation that protects every person, 
in this country. And when you look at Mike Pence, who's a notorious uh, visceral homophobe, uh, that's really disturbing because just like abortion, you know, we think that these things are past us. No, contrary to that, we have to do everything in our power to actually move forward. Progress doesn't happen in a straight line. And I, and I really fear that we're going backwards on this, especially with the new administration. And uh, I'm really worried about Mike Pence and what he's going to do to um, roll back the little gay rights, uh, you know, gains that we've made, Paul. Well, the and, you know, I wanted to say, yeah, go on. I was going to say the same thing applies to policing. In Baltimore, where we are, <coughs> where we're based, the Department of Justice uh, did a, a report on the Baltimore Police Department, and everyone's been using the word, so I will as well, because it's, it's correct. It's a scathing report on, on the way police violate people's constitutional rights, the police violate federal law, um, which is a criminal act. They don't use that conclusionary word, which they should, but they go, they go right up to the edge of that. And while the recommendations are pretty weak, more training, more data collection, the description of the problem is, is, is very strong. Um, now, of course, we know the DOJ plays this role because they want to mitigate the worst abuses of police departments uh, because it tends to enrage people and cause uprisings, and they don't want the uh, police violence to be so far over the edge. Of course, they don't want a fundamental change in police culture which means be the hammer to contain poverty in, in inner cities like Baltimore. Now, on the other hand, what will happen next with the Jeff Sessions as uh, Attorney General? You have Trump, the law and order president. All the speeches of the Republican Party were about being far more uh, hawkish in relationship to policing. We know there's already more than a thousand people killed by uh, police now, and, and way disproportionately people of color. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts about this, what tr yeah. especially what Trump's election might do to policing? Well, I think it speaks, a, it says a lot to Obama's presidency that Black Lives Matter erupted and, of course, Occupy Wall Street, erupted under the first African-American president that we've had in this country. He did not do a damn thing. Talk, 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 talk. Reforms, body cameras, look, we've seen time and again, cops will either shut them off or throw them out. They don't care. Like... The only thing that is going to be able to bring accountability to, and I will say killer police, because when I see a video of a cop literally chasing someone, shooting them in the back, I mean, that's murder, all right? So these people need to be in prison. Um, and I think that until cops are put in jail for appropriate measures of time um, for the acts that they commit, then nothing is going to move forward. It's kind of the permit for plunder thing that we were talking about earlier. That's a huge Huge problem. I wanted to talk about some stats here. Like you said, nearly a thousand people have been killed by police so far this year. 227 of them were mentally ill. My friend, Apollo Lango, who I knew in college in San Diego, his brother was one of these people who was killed. He was holding a vape pen, which is the thing that everyone smokes these days, you know, replacing cigarettes. And he was just holding it in his hand, having kind of a manic episode. Of course, he gets executed by police. This is a huge problem. And, and, you know, you look at Israel, where the Israeli military is who's training with police officers in this country. So I guess it's kind of not surprising that you have summary execution as kind of the first, first line of defense for these police officers. But, you know, 500 of the people who've been killed had a gun. And that doesn't mean that they were threatening the police with a gun. As we saw time and again, especially in open carry states, you can have a gun, all right? As a person of color, I know that's hard for some people to hear, you can have a gun in an open carry state. That doesn't mean you should get executed. So, and, you know, think about that. 500 other people didn't even have a gun. So it just puts it into a giant, you know, perspective here. Um, this is an epidemic. And Obama has done nothing except talk and kind of, uh, you know, offer some reforms here that really will not do anything until police are tried, put in jail, and none of these closed juries and none of these, you know, anything like that. We need a fair and open process and real accountability here, Paul. And I, I think this, this sense that police departments feel they have impunity in using this kind of violence, and because they do. Uh, but I, I would say, you know, again, with the DOJ report in Baltimore and, and some of the other reports that uh, have led to consent decrees in different cities in the country, as, as weak as they are, um, and although as the actual consent decrees are, what police departments have to do. Um, as I say, the critique in Baltimore was pretty good. 
but as weak as all that is, there is at least a modicum of pressure on city councils, on mayors, on police chiefs to at least rein in the worst of the excesses. I, I think what's coming now with Trump and, and Sessions as attorney general is there's not even going to be that, even a modicum of restraint. Quite the contrary. Right. There's going to be quite an emboldening of the worst elements of policing in the country. And you saw the, the tilling the ground for that at the Republican convention. Sheriff David Clark, who's the sheriff of Milwaukee County, a black sheriff, gave the most, I mean, a really fascist kind of speech and came very close to calling the leaders of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement uh, criminals and complicit in the assassination of police officers. And the, 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 it's, it's being, as, as weak as it's been, it's, it looks like it's going to get far more draconian. You had Newt Gingrich a few months ago calling for the reconstituting of the House of Un-American Activities Committee. And, and how often have we seen that phrase used, un-American, and applied it to the leadership of the movement for black lives and, and other progressives and left forces, yeah. anti-war forces, but really zeroing, uh, zeroing targeting uh, the leaders of the movement for black lives. Absolutely. And we know stop and frisk is going to be a policy that Trump is going to employ. It doesn't matter that facts have, um, you know, pointed that it actually does not work at all. And it's nothing more than racial profiling. Um, but he has embraced that. He says law and order, law and order. That's all he can really say about the solution of over policing. Um, it makes no sense. You have Giuliani mm -hmm. in his ear, Newt Gingrich, all these crazy outliers who are obsessed with over-policing and criminalization of minorities. I mean, we already know that Jeff Sessions is horrible on criminal justice reform. Um, and, you know, the private prison stocks, I'm sure, are popping right back up <laughs> after, the, after the election. Uh, so let me, let me raise just a couple of things that are somewhat positive out of 2016. Because uh, uh, so far, as, uh, we, it's been, I know a lot of people are saying we can't wait for 2016 to be over, worst year of my life, and so on and so on. But there are a few things. I thought the movement to elect Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. made some significant breakthroughs. Um, there, there were limits to the campaign, we know, and a lot of people didn't like the way uh, Bernie Sanders, in, in the end, endorsed Hillary Clinton. Didn't like, some people didn't like him endorsing her at all. Some people didn't like the way he endorsed her. Um, and I, you can have the whole debate. I understand why Sanders considered Trump such a danger, and frankly, I think Trump is such a danger. Uh, but that being said, the Sanders movement and Bernie Sanders group that led that campaign, they did a few things I think that had never been done before, and they point to what's possible in the future. One is they broke the monopoly on who's got money to fund elections. And I thought that was an enormous breakthrough, that to compete with Clinton and, and come close to being Clinton, beating Clinton with a small donor-funded campaign and is, is something entirely new. I don't think these parties, Democratic and Republican Party, were ever built with that even in mind, that it was possible for a candidate not to have to go to the well of b billionaires in order to fund a campaign. So, so I, th I thought that was really important and significant. The second thing is Sanders, certainly for his campaign, and not as strongly after he endorsed Hillary Clinton, but during his campaign, reintroduced language of class. There's a billionaire class. Mm -hmm. There's an oligarchy. Um, and, and that resonated with people. And certainly youth just were so thirsty to hear such language because everyone knows it's true. It just never gets spoken in polite conversation. It doesn't get spoken, especially on mainstream television. I thought that was significant, the fact that he called himself a socialist. You can debate how much of a socialist or he isn't a socialist, but the fact that he used the word and millions of people responded, uh, that, that tells us there's a future here, that, something that can be built on. What, what were your thoughts? Well, my number one bad thing that happened was Trump winning, but not for the reason that you know Trump is necessarily going to be president. It's the emboldening of his supporters the racists, all these psychos on the ground who, you know, are committing hate crimes and attacks against minorities. So I think that that is really bad. But like you said, there was this, there's this populist sentiment, this anti-establishment sentiment that has grown and fostered during the entire election process. And I think that is extremely positive. It's just that it was siphoned in a negative way, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but I do think that a lot of these people can move over um, because they 
saw Trump as the savior from the billionaire class, even though he is a billionaire. Don't ask me how that logic works. I'm just saying I think that there is a positive outcome where there is some crossover between the two camps. And of course, Bernie Sanders, you know, I think he really missed the boat on a lot of things. But you're right, introducing socialism. Um, for the first time, people actually are not adverse to, you know, the official religion of the U.S., which is anti-communism for the last 50 years. So I think that that's a huge step forward is kind of understanding having a broader economic analysis of, of what the problems are structurally in the world and understanding how they fit into income inequality in the U.S., making that a primary issue and hammering that over and over again on the media was great. It, it shows you that there's a lot of potential. Um, all the young people voted for Bernie. All the young people were disillusioned um, with the two-party system. A lot of young people don't trust the mainstream media. These are huge, significant um, trends that are really good and positive, and we can harness them and utilize them to build an actual united progressive front. Um, but, you know, I do think that Trump winning has, has uh, made us lost the plot on a lot <laughs> to, be, uh, to be illustrative. Um, you know, I, I just think it's funny that after all this time, there's still zero self-reflection from the Democratic Party, and they just, they just can't believe it still. And, you know, blame Russia and third parties, I guess, never themselves. But Look, the Trump thing, it, it, at the very least, I mean, he removed that bureaucratic middleman, right? So he removed, I mean, what's the difference between Citigroup appointing Obama's cabinet and Trump appointing Goldman Sachs head for his economic advisory team? Yes, yes, I know that there are a lot of other crazy things like Sessions and, and all the other people in his cabinet. But I mean, when you're talking about like these corporate CEOs coming in and getting gifted giant positions, it's not really that different. I don't think that Trump is going to bring fascism. I think fascism has been coming. The, the seed has been sown for a very long time. And we're in a dangerous climate. But I don't think that Trump is an anomaly. If you yeah, know. I think that's very important. I don't think Trump's an anomaly at all. Trump is a legitimate representative of just how degenerate finance has become. Exactly. And, 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 and so directly, as you said, there used to be at least sort of middleman relationship. Now you have direct rule by the billionaires. And in Trump's case, specifically Robert Mercer, who, is, who represents uh, probably the most parasitical type of finance on Wall Street, which is this quantitative high-speed trading. And Mercer is uh, co-CEO of Renaissance Technology, which is the most profitable hedge fund on Wall Street by a long shot. 500 of the best mathematicians and physicists all working on how to game the stock market. Mercer, it's Mercer who Kellyanne Conway worked for before she took over the Trump campaign and before that helped Mercer finance the uh, Cruz campaign. Uh, Steve Bannon, who's the chief strategist uh, of, of Trump now, worked for Mercer at uh, Breitbart News, of course, the biggest investor in Breitbart News is Mercer, and Mercer's daughter, Rebecca, is on the Trump transition team. So you have like a direct control of one of the most parasitical sections of capital directly in the White House. And don't, we should of course not forget Mr. Parasitical Capital himself, Sheldon Adelson, oh, who yeah. gave Trump $25 million and is also on the inauguration committee. And, is, and clearly uh, does not give $25 million to someone he doesn't expect will do, uh, do a pro-Israel policy in Sheldon's, uh, to Sheldon's liking. Uh, so, but this is very much the outgrowth of mm -hmm. what's happened to Wall Street and finance with Bill Clinton, certainly under Bush and certainly under Obama, which is essentially giving uh, finance a free hand and, and, the, and with a free hand, the most parasitical gambling sectors of finance take control, and now they've got direct control of the White House. Uh, they had pretty much control before, now it's just direct. Yeah, I mean, this is a crisis of global capitalism, and we're seeing an uh, emergence and resurgence of the right wing in Japan, all across Europe, um, some of South and Latin America, um, and India, even. So I think that it's happening here. I think that there's uh, two ways it can go. Right now, we're seeing a huge uptick and resurgence of the right wing on the ground, this emboldening of, of alt-right uh, kind of trolls <laughs> who now feel victorious. But I think that in, in that same kind of movement and, and feeling, there is a huge opportunity for us to galvanize, energize, unite, and, and build that progressive front that we really need to, Paul, to win. 
Uh, let me just add one thing then. This is my hope for 2017 then. And, and, and is, is that the issue of climate change, and, which is a human existential crisis, and a society and particularly mainstream media with no sense of urgency about it at all, if there's some silver lining in, in this Trump storm cloud, is that although he's going to reverse even the, the very small measures that were taken under Obama to pull back on carbon emission and a certain amount of regulation, um, a last minute uh, pull back on drilling in the Arctic and on the eastern shore, northeast shore, uh, that, that the fact that there's climate deniers now completely running the White House, I hope will energize people to actually make this front and center, that this issue of climate change cannot be put on the back burner. You can't have some vague notion in our head that, yes, Obama is going to do something, the EPA is going to do something, it will get looked after. No, now it's really clear. Nothing's going to be done. There's no illusions about any uh, policy exactly. that's going to address climate change coming out of the White House. And the building of this broad front that's going to have to deal with this growing fascism, potential, uh, certainly I think they're going to try to reinstate full sanctions on Iran, if not bomb Iran, and, and, and geopolitical strife, uh, and, and now climate change. If there isn't a broad front, front now with a sense of urgency, uh, we're, we're running out of time in, in terms of, uh, you know, human society as we know it. Yeah, and I think we we totally forgot Standing Rock as a huge, um, great, great thing that happened this year. It showed direct action um, succeeding. It showed a, a huge emboldening of the uh, Native American population that we've never seen before. And I'm speaking on behalf of people who have been leaders, you know, the American Indian Movement, who have said that the, there's nothing that has ever happened on this level, on this scale. So I think that that is a huge, huge positive step. And it's kind of a, a big awakening also, right, that we need to almost go to that length in order to, to stop these people. And we saw even Obama putting a, putting a stop to the permit. Um, the company said, no, we're going to move forward anyway. So we're seeing energy, we're seeing finance acting completely without constraints. And they know moving forward, you know, Rick Perry's obviously invested in the Dakota Access Pipeline. You have Trump, who's also invested in it. Um, so I think that moving forward, this is a huge wake-up call. We've seen that it will work. And this is the only thing that we can do, especially on the climate front, Paul. And I'm going to be there every step of the way. And I just, um, I just feel really pumped up to get involved and get on the ground. Well, we're, as, as people watching Real News know, we're in the midst of our year-end fundraising campaign. And next year, uh, we're going to be pushing very hard to create the Global Climate Change Bureau so we can do daily climate news, both in terms of urgency and solutions. So uh, if you haven't donated yet to our matching grant uh, campaign, please, there's only a few days left, uh, maybe a couple of weeks, I guess, uh, with, to, for us to reach our goal. And uh, so if you're watching Real News and you haven't donated, uh, now's the time to click the Donate button. Abby, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks so much, Paul. And thank you for joining us on the Real News Network.